Thank you for joining me. The AHA released a statement condemning the senseless killing of an unarmed black man in Minneapolis and acknowledging the protests that are occurring in cities across the country really shaken our nation to its core. So I'm really pleased to have Anton Gunn and Juana Slade with me to talk a little bit about what you're doing in your own organization and community to address some of the events over the last week and a half and help other hospitals and health systems as they start to address this. Well, I'll go first and and, and uh-huh. say that this has been um, a, um, a, a very a troubling past few days for me. Uh, I think the we've been inundated with despicable images. Um, we've seen pain. We've seen fear. We've seen anguish. And unfortunately, we've seen um, suffering on display for not only the entire country, but for the whole world to see. And um, this I guess the the issue that's been most troubling for me, I'm a person of of African heritage, and so it was very troubling for me to realize that um, this wasn't terribly unfamiliar. Um, I've heard my husband have conversations with his son about their behavior uh, should they be stopped by the police. Um, I've had I've had conversations with my friends about similar situations with their husbands and and their sons and hearing those painful very difficult conversations and recognizing that uh what was horrific on on television what was horrific online what was horrific in print unfortunately was a was a part of uh the experience the lived experience for many people, in particular African-American men uh, all across the country. Um, I think that most hospitals and most communities uh, consider themselves anchors within their community. And if you are an anchor, uh, that implies that you've got to hold down. So I believe that our hospital systems, uh, our hospitals across the state, and around the country need to take responsibility for holding down this very tough conversation. Uh, Not tamping it down, but holding it down, keeping it focused, keeping it centered so that we can have very tough conversations that will result in changes across our communities. That will take candid, difficult conversations with people who may not be able to identify with the topic, but we should be a part of um, the infrastructure that takes our communities there, that leads us to those kinds of conversations. So quite frankly, I don't think that as an anchor institution uh, in our community, we don't have the luxury of walking away. We've got to be a part of that conversation, if not uh, because of uh, what our roles are, but because of who is there, because of who works within our hospital systems, uh, who has many of who are the individuals that have many of the jobs that uh, will not have the luxury of uh, working from home? Um, who will have the jobs that will p- put them at risk? Who uh, will be responsible for making sure that our facilities are prepared uh, for the next patient that walks through the door, COVID or positive or not? And so we've got to make sure that if we are demanding that our team members uh, support our organization, we have to in turn support the communities that they come from, and we also have to provide that safe space for that difficult conversation. Anton? First, let me just say, um, as a black man, living in America for nearly 50 years, uh, like Juana, I I was... um, not at all surprised by what I saw um, because it didn't matter how many years I went to school, how many degrees I got, what kind of job I got. I can leave my house and go to the grocery store, and if I see a police car behind me, my physiology changes in my body because of that, because I know what could happen. What happened to George Floyd and Tamir Rice and Eric Garner and Fernando Castile Sandra Bland, 
and many others could happen to me. And it doesn't matter what I've done every day. I know it's real. So for me, this has been uh, traumatizing and, again, repeatedly traumatizing for my entire life. My first instance of this happened in 1989 as a teenager and then in 91 with the Rodney King beating. So this is a replayed conversation over and over again, and it's been hard. So what I would say to any uh, healthcare organization and the people in the healthcare organization is the first thing that I would say to do is to check on your people. And if you have employees that are employees of color or employees who you know um, would have been impacted by this in any kind of way, and all of us should be impacted, but I think the important thing for any organization is to check on your people, is to ask people how they're doing and create spaces internally for people to express what they're doing, uh, what, they're, what, they're, what they're experiencing. And, and I would say secondarily, um, given that we know that racism is real in America and we see structural, institutional barriers around race that have impacted the populations that hospital serves, the communities that hospitals are in, to Juana's point, as an anchor institution, as an anchor institution, you must look at how you are contributing to the problem or contributing to the solution. And I would dare say more hospitals are, have the ability to contribute to the solution than it being a part of the problem. So here's an example. As an anchor institution, you're the largest employer in the region. So who are you hiring? What zip codes are you hiring from? Have you taken a framework around being an anchor institution to create career paths and job opportunities for those who could be impacted by some of what we saw on television? Uh, where do you put your money? So all healthcare organizations have very large bank accounts. Are you banking with black banks or other minority financial institutions to create asset opportunities for people to get loans to buy their own home and start their own business? So there's a couple of things that people can do right away. But I think more than anything else, we have to have this conversation around race. And it shouldn't just be a conversation to say that we talked about it. But now that we have talked about it, what can we do to bring more racial justice as an institution? And every institution has its own challenges and its own roller coaster that they're on. But I think it's incumbent upon the leaders in that institution to say, listen, this is what we're going to do. You know, whether it's scholarships for, you know, underrepresented minorities to go to medical school or the nursing school or to get their Ph.D. I mean, whatever it is, you got to invest in building the kind of community, the beloved community that doesn't allow these things to, to, to happen. And it also means that as the largest institution, you have a political role as well. I mean, the mayor is going to pay attention to the place that provides the most jobs in his city. Mm -hmm. And if that's the local hospital, the health system, then you should be asking the mayor, what are we doing to make sure what happened in this community never happens in our community? And how can we be helpful to you? And my last point would be, every hospital should be trying to become a high reliability organization. We know what just culture looks like, and we know what it means to be preoccupied with failure and to not to oversimplify our operations and to have deference to expertise. We have a tremendous amount of insight of how do we make sure that we don't make mistakes when we're delivering care. So what are you doing as a health system to talk to your local law enforcement organizations about building a high reliability, just culture in their organizations, similar to what we provide in healthcare organizations. These are things that I believe would help us move down the road of racial justice and addressing the savage inequalities in law enforcement outcomes and also the savage inequalities in every aspect of diversity in our communities. And we have to do it because, and when I say we, collectively we, because I'm exhausted. I am personally exhausted. Mm -hmm. But I'm also a leader, and I know that I don't have time to be exhausted. That in, in difficult times, it is a leader's responsibility to step up. It's a leader's responsibility to get above the fray 
tell the truth, tell it with their heart, but most importantly, do something to make it right. And that's what every one of us inside an organization, inside our families, inside a community must be compelled to do, or we may lose everything that we have. And that's everything. I don't think it could be said better. Anton and Juana, thank you so much for your heartfelt and very personal reactions. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for having me.